All right, this morning, our lesson is entitled Accountable. It's taken from Acts chapter 4 and verse 36 through chapter 5 and verse 11. So let's read the printed text and then we'll come back and discuss it. And Yosef, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came upon all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it? that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, mm -hmm. and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. Now, that's kind of a rough story, all right? But you know what? There's times to praise the Lord in both the good and the bad. This is also a time to praise the Lord in something that happened that was bad because it was a corrective action to give guidance and direction to this fledgling church in what to do and what not to do. You know... <clears throat> The original law was the Ten Commandments. And it was made up of thou shalts and thou shalt nots. Sometimes the thou shalts are harder to do than the thou shalt nots. But here, one of the things that we don't want to do is lie, especially to try to lie to God. And this is an example that God decided to have in the scriptures to show there are consequences for tempting or lying to God. Now, we lie to men all the time. You know, we, that's just what we do. We don't have to be taught how to lie, and women lie to women. So, we don't have to be taught how to lie. It comes naturally. Remember, I told you a story about Becky talking to Kai, and, you know, saying that God was truth, God didn't lie, and God doesn't expect us to lie. And he said, well, good luck with that. <laughs> Fine. So, you get it. But we just don't want to lie to God. So it's a very interesting lesson. God holds believers accountable for their motives in service. Now motives is something I'm always more looking at instead of the action. What was the motive behind the action? Because I think that's the way God looks at things a lot of times. What's the motive behind the action? We can do motives that look good to everybody and yet they're impure. Or we can do something that looks not so good but the motive was good. So let's take a look here and see. One of the things that, um, that I read was that uh, great responsibility uh, or great accountability comes with great responsibility. So the more you're responsible for, the more you're accountable. The more you're accountable for, the more you're responsible for, however that goes. But... We, we get put into positions 
that we have to be accountable to God for what we do with it because of the responsibility he gave us. Who is somebody that the Bible talks about has to be accountable for what they do? Preacher? Who else? Teacher. And that's, all, that's always in my mind, you know. God, help me to do the best I can because, you know, I'm accountable for bringing truth. So these are things that are very important. And, uh, and we're accountable to you, too, to make sure you do. Well, yeah, that's right. That's why Chris sits right up here and helps me. And I praise God for it. <laughs> because I'll get tongue tied or I might say something backwards or whatever. She helps me. And I, and I have others in here to help me too, and I appreciate that. So that's always great. I'm still human. All right, so let's look at this and see what's going on. Now, remember, this is the early church that's just starting. And a lot of these people have all come together and been united in their hearts because they all believe in the resurrection. They all believe in Jesus, and they've come together. And it's almost like a communal community. And it's like what I have is yours. And they share and they do everything together. And that's what's really freaking out everybody else. Because they look up and say, y'all are crazy. But that's what God said. You'll be known by your love one for another. And that's exactly what they're doing. So we got a story here. And it's talking about and J-O-S-E-S, which is basically Joseph. But if you look at how they pronounce J, it's be yeah, Joseph. And he was surnamed Barnabas by who? Oh. The apostles. That was his surname, which means they gave that, they gave that to him as a last name because really they didn't have last names back in those days. It was so and so of wherever they grew up or of their father, whatever. So here they said his name's going to be uh, Joseph Barnabas. And as we know later on, they dropped the Yosef and they just called him Barnabas. And he was a great, great missionary guy, uh, a great mentor. He actually, you know, mentored Paul, brought Paul under his wings and, you know, helped Paul when his journey was beginning. Well, what does Barnabas mean? Son of consolation. Son of consolation. That's how it's interpreted. Well, what does son of consolation, what does consolation mean? Encouragement. You want to console somebody. You want to encourage him. He was just a guy that wanted to bring peace and prosperity. Always talking about Jesus and talking about what a great miracle worker he was and everybody needs Jesus. And he was just awesome and he would try to help people to see this. So, Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation. He was also a Levite. And he was of the country of Cyprus. So this is a very unique individual because of his background. If he was a Levite, that means he came from the tribe of Levi. Levi. Who else came from the tribe of Levi? Well, I mean, what group? The priests. The priest. Okay. Now, one of the things that um, the, 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 the guy by the name of Kohath, which is where the Levitical priest came to, which was a son of Levi. And they also had a couple other sons that were named Gershon and Merari. Now, they also had uh, responsibilities in the temple, but they uh, were not of the priest. That was from Kohath. Now, I'm assuming then that uh, Barnabas was from the other guys because he was not in the temple serving as a priest. As a matter of fact, he wasn't anywhere near the temple because he grew up in Cyprus, which is a, an island uh, in the Mediterranean Sea off the coast of Syria, but its background is Greek. So here we have a gentleman that came from the line of the Levites, so he knows the law. He's also grew up Greek, so he understands Greek culture. So what a perfect situation for a person to be out ministering to both Jews and Gentiles. Perfect. So God must have had his hand on this man to direct him into the ministry because of where God placed him to set up his background. God will do that. That's just like God. You know, he'll, he'll put you in a place 
teach you stuff, to be able to use you at a later point in time for a certain thing. Now, to me, that's exciting. I, I you know, if God uses me and I, I see it, that's just to me just wonderful. And God will put you in places, and uh, I just think it's kind of cool. So. This son of consolation, Barnabas, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, <coughs> having the land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, there's a lot of stuff packed in this really first uh, verse or two here. So another thing it says he probably wasn't a Levite of the priesthood is because they didn't have any land, did they? What was their inheritance? Sure. Well, the Lord. Yeah. That was their inheritance. So, you know, they God was going to take care of them. That was a very special group that completely 100% trusted in God to provide for them. Because they didn't get an inheritance of land, but they got an inheritance of God. So here it said that Barnabas had some land. So how did he get the land? He could have gotten land because he you know, wasn't a, a, the Levitical priesthood. And it says he sold it. And he brought the money and laid it at his apostles' feet. Okay. This is not saying that we have to sell all of our stuff and bring it to the church. That's not what this is saying. This is not uh, a prescription. You know, this is just something that you allow God to show you what you should do. Now, when it comes to uh, giving, according to the scriptures, Christians should contribute of their means cheerfully, regularly, systematically, proportionately, and liberally for the advancement of the kingdom. But that's between you and God. There's no prescription that you have to give everything you've got to God. Although, it already belongs to God. Yes. Yeah. Right? Right. Everything we have belongs to God. And on this uh, idea of the land, it doesn't say that he first gave everything he had. No. It just said he had land mm -hmm. that he sold. Right. He sold some land. Was it all or was it put, put some? Exactly. We don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Exactly. But he took it, what he sold, and he took that money and laid it at the apostles' feet. How much of the money did he lay at the apostles' feet? All of it. All of it. Okay. So we've got a Jew with a Greek background who had some land, sold it, laid it at the apostles' feet. So what was that for? For the community. He believed that the apostles were carrying on the work that Jesus had established. So much so that he was going to support it and fund it as best he could. Now, sometimes when a large gift is presented to God, it can motivate others to do the same. But there's a caveat there. We've got to be very, very careful. In, if I see somebody come up and get a whole bunch of money, and I say, well, I'm going to do the same thing so everybody will brag on me too. It's bad motivation. It's a hard issue. Yeah, it's a hard issue. It's right. Hard. So what we want to do is allow God to direct us to do things. We're always making sure that people try to do the right thing is what God wants. Even when it comes down to Bible school. When little kids, you know, are in a revival or something, if some kids come up to get saved and a bunch of them come up, you want to ask them, why are you coming forward? Because Johnny did. Well, no, that's not the right answer. You want to make sure they understand what they're doing. And that goes with adults, too. We want to make sure we know what we're doing and that our motives are pure. That's the whole thing about this, is that we have pure motives in our actions because actions can be misleading. Okay? So, he was a Levite. He was from Cyprus, which was Greek. And he was always trying to encourage people and lead them to Jesus, thus the name Barnabas. Okay. Mike, yes, going back up to verse 34, I think it gives you a good background of, of what the early church was doing. Yeah. 
Oh, you're because exactly it says right. that they all sold their land and houses and were coming together as a community. So like it a community. was kind of like a, that was the way they did things. What I see it is like a commune, a, commu right. a communal. Everybody right. shared everything they had, right. which in theory is a beautiful thing. Right. I just don't think it works well, except in the church. But it didn't say some sold. It said all sold. If they, they owned land or houses, they all sold. They all gave what they had. That's right. To the community, to the group. Right. Okay? Yes, Dr. Mike. I used to worry, not worry, I used to think about that and all. And then someone pointed out it wasn't the government. You know what I'm saying? The government. Yeah. yeah. Now, the government just takes. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> You know, we don't have to give. And sometimes they don't want to give back what they owe you. I'm still waiting on my state check overpayment. It's been like almost four months, and I still don't have it. Yeah, anyway, what if I withheld my money from them, what they would do? Well, you, you get a place to live in three meals. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and they penalize you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... Barnabas brought it and laid it at the apostles' feet. So the apostles were probably teaching, and there was a group or a crowd there. He brings this money and lays it down, setting an example for others to follow. Okay? He believed in what the apostles were doing. But we've got to be careful about our motives. All right, let's go over here now to 5 verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession okay so they saw probably what Barnabas did they saw the accolades he got Satan entered into them said do the same thing but just get part of it but let them think you gave it all Now, let's take note. Man and his wife. Satan enters them both. Now, she might have had to be coerced by him. I don't know. But they were both in on it, as we see later. Can you think of another deadly pact between a husband and a wife? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. There you go. So, he was a certain man named Ananias. His wife Sapphira. They sold something and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it, and they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. All right, you're in that church service. You see what's going on. Are you impressed? <coughs> sure. Wow. Cool. Okay. Starting a trend here. Going to be be bringing more and more stuff in here for the furtherance of the kingdom. Well, the Greek wording for kept back means to set something apart, but it also carries a sense of dishonesty. So when it says they kept a portion back, it's exposing their dishonesty in the writings here. Now, the writings are after the fact, after things occurred, so they knew what was going on. How did they know what had happened? How did the people figure this out? Because they knew what the price was. We're getting ready to come up to it. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So how did Peter know? You checked the checkbook record. <laughs> <laughs> Credit card receipts. How did Peter know this? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was running rampant back in these days. Did he stop? No. No. He's still running rampant. Sometimes we stop listening. Yeah. Okay? So, they see what Barnabas did. They want to get some of that glory. And that's a typical situation even today. 
People like to be bragged on. People like to have good attention brought to them. And sometimes we do things for the wrong motive. So they sold it. They kept some of the money back. They brought a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet just like Barnabas did. And Peter was sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. God spoke to him, told him what was going on. And right there, Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the land? So right here he identifies you lied to the Holy Ghost. We're going to see in a minute, says you lied to God. Because the Holy Ghost isn't an it. The Holy Ghost is God. Just as God is God, Jesus is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. They're all three God expressed in three separate entities. Okay? So when you're speaking to about one, you're speaking about them all. All right? So why have Satan filled thine heart to the light of the Holy Ghost and to keep back and to try to mislead us? You lied to the Holy Spirit. What's the one sin that cannot be forgiven? Not believing. Yeah, you said it the best way. Rejection. The sin against the Holy Spirit is not believing. That's right, Don. But it involves the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the one that calls you, that convicts you. So there, thus, it's the sin against the Holy Spirit. It's against God, but it's rejection of God. So the Holy Spirit's always been there. In the beginning was God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Where did they come from? Yes. Yes. <laughs> These are things to give you headaches. <laughs> trying to think about it. God is the beginning. Okay? But so you brought some of this in here and you said this is you sold this and gave all this money. But that's not the truth, Ananias. Now when he came in, he gave him a chance. He laid it out to him and said, This is what it is. And Ananias had already done the deed. He could have stopped at any time. As Peter goes on down through, he said, while it remained, was it not thine own? You had it. It was yours. Nobody asked you for it. It was yours. And then after it was sold, it was still yours to do with whatever you want. He's laying out what's getting ready to happen, why it's happening. This was yours. Nobody asked you for it. Nobody commanded you to give it. You just decided you are going to do it and then with the money, you had the same choice. And you decided to make everybody think you were giving it all and you kept some back. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Why'd you do that, Ananias? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Okay, there's God. Holy Ghost, now it's God. There and I was just standing there. Probably dumbfounded. Like, how'd you know this? He's probably trying to figure out who ratted me out. <laughs> Where's Sapphira? Did she tell? What's going on? Who knows what's going on in his mind? But Ananias, hearing these words, fell down dead. It says, fell down and gave up the ghost. That means he died. And great fear came upon all them that heard these things. Now, that's a freaky scenario right there. He comes in, lays money down. Everybody's like, oh, yay, Ananias, go, boy, go. You're doing good. And then Peter says, hold it. Why'd you let Satan influence you like this? Here's what you did. Here's what's going to happen. Boom, and he dies. Now, people said fear fell upon them. Now, fear can mean exactly what it says. Fear, panic, but there's another word for fear. Reverence. Reverence. Respect all, which is really what it is here. They reverenced God for the power that God exhibited in knowing that Ananias lied and did this. And they were praising God because God's giving them more direction to help them not commit the same type of sin that Ananias did. That's why they can praise him in a terrible situation because of the instruction. 
So like when we get weapons from God, mm. we can praise Him. Now I've tried to think back of when I'd punish my kids if they ever praised me for that. I don't think <laughs> that ever occurred. But it's a whole different scenario here. You know, this is with God who loves us more than any parent can love a child. You think about how much you love your kids. It don't compare to how God loves us. So, they were in respect and reverence of God and praised Him. And then verse 6. And the young men arose, wound him up, carried him out, and buried him. Boom. Fast. He died. Get him. Bind him up. Take him out and bury him. It's over. It's done. He's removed. He's been taken away. And that's what happened. Now, they had the chance to not do this. But they had planned it. They both knew it. They went through with it. They did it. And then they suffered the consequences. <clears throat> Ananias and Sapphira did not commit an impulsive act of dishonesty. dishonesty. They planned it. It was premeditated. Sometimes sins overtake us just because we get caught up and it just overtakes us. This was not that case. This was a premeditated, planned sin to deceive the people, but to test God. We don't test God. Mm. We don't tempt God. We hear God speak and we obey as best we can. It you know, says you can test them in one place in the Bible. And that would be... Uh, in Malachi, uh, test me and see if not, I will oh, open up the floodgates. Yeah. Other than that, he says, do not test me. Well... We need to look at the definitions yeah. of those tests. But okay. God, yeah, but that's good, Art. I'm impressed. That was pretty good. Uh, but God is God. God makes the rules. God made us. God made everything. So God gets to make the rules. Now, either we accept him as supreme authority or we don't. Now, when we accept Christ as our personal Savior, we say we submit to you, God. We belong to you. You are in control of our lives. Now, we got to prove that sometimes that we really did mean that when we said that. God's got to come first. You say the word fear is reverence, but I think they were scared, too. Well, you don't mess around. I, I would have been scared, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's probably a little bit of both, but the, the text said in here... And I, I need to try to do a little study on that to see which one exactly. But they said it was more in the respect yeah. or awestruck uh, situation. And but Evaluate the motivation. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. All right, so he dies. And it says it was a frightening thing, but it was also a scene of respect for God and who he was and what he expects. Here it says the Greek word used by Luke can mean terror or panic. However, it can also be used to describe respect and reverence as it is here. God's work among his people, even a work of church discipline, led people to glorify and honor him, which is the case. We should thank God for the correction. We need to thank God for the Bible. We have God's word and we should thank him for that. It's something we've got. We can read it. We can study it. We can ask God to give us direction. That's all stuff that we've got. And, you know, back here, they're writing the Bible. Now, they've got, you know, the Torah, but they're writing the New Testament as they're living in that time. So God's still very active. All right, let's move over to verse 7. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife not knowing what was done, came in. Why did it take her three hours to come in? She was hiding the other half. She was fixing yeah, her makeup. Was <laughs> she was hiding the money, fixing her makeup, shopping, cleaning house. It doesn't say what the reason was. Three hours later, she comes in not knowing anything. Okay? And Peter says he answered unto it. He answered unto her. He said to her, Tell me whither ye sold the land for so much. 
He's given her a chance to come clean. He said, how much did you sell the land for, Sapphira? She said, yeah, that's, that's how much we sold it for. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? He nails her. Mm. Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Mm. Now, man, that's a heck of a thing to hear. She just comes in, be bopping alone, everything's cool, and then she gets nailed asking you, how much did you sell that land for? Same thing. Yeah, yeah, we did. No, you didn't. Why are you tempting the Holy Spirit? He said, the feet of the men that just buried your husband are at the door to carry you out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, found her dead, and carried her forth and buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Peter was trying to give her an opportunity. She wouldn't take it. She stayed with the plan. And he said, all right, here's the deal. Your husband lied to the Holy Spirit and he fell dead. They just buried him. Now they're coming back in. They're going to go bury you. Now, some people said, well, she had a heart attack and died. Maybe. But God took her out. The Holy Spirit uh, prompts us towards uh, repentance. But yeah, he does. And so you, then you get to choose. <clears throat> she lied to the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now, <clears throat> we can... I always like to say we can form a hard callus around our heart where we can't feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's a bad place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to be there. It comes after multiple rejections. Yes, Steve, that's right. That's right. You, yeah. you, you build it up just like on your fingers and hands. You build calluses up for years and years. Same thing here. You don't want to be there where you can't feel conviction from the Holy Spirit to help you to ask for forgiveness. So, she wasn't going to, she's sticking with her plan. And Peter said, okay, they just buried your husband, you're next. And she fell down and died at his feet. And then great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. So there again, is that word fear? I still think there might have been a little freaking out in there and panicking, but also the respect. Now, what does this lesson mean to us today? Make sure your motivation for doing what you do for the Lord is pure. You know, when you say something, you know, to, don't do things to try to make yourself look good. All throughout the Bible, Jesus would bring honor to God. The apostles were trying to bring honor to Jesus. That's what we need to do. Whatever we do, we need to try to put the honor and the glory back to God, back to Christ and the Holy Spirit. Not to us. Uh... You see a lot of things where a lot of people, preachers, get into situations where they get a lot of accolades, a lot of things honored on them, and then you see a lot. Of, you see preachers that fail. They're human. They're man. You know, they're they're just like us. They're susceptible to sin, to temptation, just like we are. Let's don't set ourselves up too high, because you know what it says: pride goeth before a fall. The more pride, the greater the fall. So, it, it's one of those lessons that's kind of tough to hear, but there's a reason for it. And we praise God because He does correct us. If God didn't correct us, what would that mean? He didn't love us. Or we weren't His. Okay. Exactly, same thing. So, we praise God for the correction, and we thank Him for it. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, once again, we just want to thank You for another day You've given us. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. And Lord, we thank you for the Bible, that we can study it, we can see who you are, what you expect and what you want. Help us, Father, to study it. Help us to draw closer to you. Help us to corral our motivations for the things that we do. Help everything go to giving you the glory and the praise and the honor. And now I pray, Lord, that you go with us into the next hour. You would speak to us the words we need to hear from our pastor. And we lift up these names that have such need for healing, for whatever the situation is, Father, for comfort, that you would be with those people. Heal them, comfort them, 
and just have your way. Protect those that are traveling or going to be traveling. And we give you all the praise for it, Father, in Jesus' name, and amen.